As someone who grew up in the 90s and early 2000s, Steve-O was a pretty big part of my childhood. I imagine it was the same for a lot of the people who watch my channel. Since the halcyon days of the early 2000s, we've watched the people from those shows go their own separate ways and develop their respective careers. For Steve-O, it famously took a pretty dark turn there for a while, but he was eventually able to pull his life back from the brink. For over a decade now, Steve-O has been putting together an interesting resume as a stand-up comedian, and with the release of his most recent special, Steve-O's Bucket List, it seemed like a good time to explore his content. For the sake of transparency, I feel like I should say that this idea was suggested to me by Steve-O. It's not sponsored and I'm not getting paid for a review. I just thought the idea was interesting and the timing lined up for me. I should also say this video is not a commentary on Steve-O's podcasts or other work. It's just about his three specials. I've known about Steve-O's comedy for a while, but I've always been a bit hesitant to review it. The way I saw it, his show was intended to appeal to a certain group of people. I've always found that kind of comedy to be a bit difficult to review because there is a difference between something being unfunny and something simply not being your cup of tea. What got me interested in doing this video was the idea of looking at a specific performer's work in chronological order and seeing what kind of progression or regression they've made over the course of multiple specials. I've had this idea for a while now, and it's something I've wanted to do with other comedians like Louis C.K., Doug Stanhope, or George Carlin. However, their catalogs are a bit larger, and I'm more intimately familiar with them, making the task more daunting. With Steve-O, there are three specials, and they're not specials I have watched or listened to numerous times over the years. I could go into this somewhat objectively and with a clean slate, and the idea of comparing multiple specials against each other felt like an interesting challenge to me as a writer-slash-reviewer. I wanted to see what kind of growth or changes there have been over a period of pushing a decade now. But at this point, I think I've given you all enough preamble and explanation for my thought process, so I should probably get on with the reviews. Let's start with Steve-O's first special, Guilty as Charged. Right off the bat, I want to say that the title combined with the poster of Steve-O wearing a prison jumpsuit and being electrocuted is kind of giving me Anthony Cumia book vibes. If you know, you know. I decided to go into this special cold. I knew Steve-O had done stand-up for a while before the special came out, but I didn't want to potentially spoil the material by watching some proto-version of his routine recorded on somebody's cell phone camera. I wanted to watch this material as it was intended. Personally, my hopes were not high. If you're familiar with Steve-O, he's a naturally funny and charismatic guy, but there is a big leap from that to professional comedy. If you've ever watched You'd Be Surprised, you'd know what I mean. Guilty as Charged actually did surprise me, though while also weirdly being what I would expect out of the first comedy special from Steve-O. And I want to make a bit of a disclaimer here because I often find people become confused with the way I review or rate comedy. To me, the worst thing a special can be is boring. So with that in mind, I will say that Steve-O's guilty as charged is not a boring special. Steve-O opens the special up by smashing beer cans on his head, which becomes beet red by the end of the special. Within the first five minutes, he squeezes lemons into his eyes before having Tim Kennedy choke him unconscious and drop him to the ground like John Jones did to Lyoto Machida. When there is already a head injury and less time than it takes to make a batch of pizza rolls, you're setting the bar pretty high in terms of intensity. Frankly, the fact that Steve-O was able to deliver the rest of this special coherently after pre-gaming brain damage with beer cans and being dropped on his head like Richard Belzer is extremely impressive. That doesn't excuse Steve-O's opening joke because it happened before the concussion. What has four thumbs and loves blowjobs? The follow-up does kind of turn it from one of the worst jokes I've ever heard into something kind of funny, though. I fucking love blowjobs, man. Does anybody want one? <laughs> Most of the special is Steve-O telling stories, with a large part of it relating to his jackass days. If you followed Steve-O's career, the general thrust of this material will probably be at least somewhat familiar to you. He covers his early life as a fuck-up and dropout that ultimately led him to Ringling Brothers Clown College on what he describes as a scholarship. They waived my costume fee, so I went to Clown College on a fucking scholarship. There is some general background about how he ended up becoming part of the Jackass crew that leads into several longer bits about incidents that happened while filming Jackass, such as one story where he and Chris Pontius had a competition to see who could blow the most loads while riding in a car with other members of the crew. And so Knoxville's just filming all this com. As somebody who grew up watching Jackass, I was entertained by the stories, but I could easily see why somebody would not be. They kind of hinge on having prior knowledge on a certain niche of entertainment that not everybody is familiar with. For instance, when Steve-O references things like the toy car bit or the butt chug, they're going to be kind of meaningless if you never saw those stunts. 
And you need to have something invested in these jokes because they're pretty crass. And then Knoxville said, that sucked. Stick it up your ass. In particular, Steve-O tells a story about how he ended up doing a version of the butt chug that didn't make it into the movie because, according to the director, it was illegal. All this murky, yeasty, cloudy, brown shit is coming out. It was like watching a Budweiser turn into a Sam Adams. As will become a common theme in this video, I'm not sure what I can play for you without getting demonetized, or age-restricted. But Steve-O describes basically tub-girling himself with the beer colonic. Even though this bit is pretty well written and delivered, I imagine it will be divisive based purely on the subject matter. If you're easily grossed out, and or not a Jackass fan, you're probably going to struggle with a lot of Steve-O's material. I drink straight from the tap. <laughs> But if you enjoy boundary pushing blue humor, you might like it. The butt chug bit results in one of the only segues in the special when Steve-O says, At this point, you can see that I've had my problems. This leads into a segment where Steve-O talks about his issues with substance abuse and his eventual intervention. Again, if you're familiar with Steve-O, you probably know at least a little bit about these stories. But there are some good lines in here. Like Steve-O saying this was the fourth or fifth intervention that had been done in him, but previous ones had been hallucinations. And that's when you know your problem is really serious. When your hallucinations are worried about you. <laughs> the problem for Steve-O was that once he became sober, he realized he was a sex addict as well. And this part of the special is where the waters start to get a bit choppy, if you know what I mean. There are some borderline unforgivably cringe moments from the middle third of Guilty as Charged. To open the segment, Steve-O says it would be amazing if he wasn't a sex addict with a body like his, at which point he begins to do a strip tease, then wag his dick around before hopping up and fruit bowling his junk into the Buffalo Bill pose. The only thing that barely yanks the wheel of this bit out of oncoming traffic is that a woman comes on stage and kicks him in the nuts. Steve-O saying that women turn into baseball vendors when they see a man who has been on TV is also probably one of the most cringeworthy jokes I've ever heard. Fresh percent. <laughs> Hot taco! <laughs> Get ya, beaver! I actually got legit secondhand embarrassment from that one. On the other hand, the joke he tells about Subway Jared seemed a bit shoehorned in there, but the punchline actually caught me off guard. But then he shows up on the news because it turns out he likes it even fresher than I thought. <laughs> that said, the bulk of the middle of the special is a mixed bag of stories about Steve-O struggling with sex addiction that were exacerbated by his fame and easy access to willing participants. For instance, the bit about getting into a threesome and being thankful for having an ugly girl giving him a toothy BJ because he busts early is a pretty interesting concept. It's something that wouldn't feel out of place in a Doug Stanhope special. That sentiment goes double for the story he tells about going down on a stripper with a sweaty cooch. I felt like I was making out with a pile of sweaty nickels. <laughs> it was like I was using my tongue to scrape mold out of a broken refrigerator. The imagery here is actually pretty amusing, even if it's undercut a bit by Steve-O's delivery and mugging like he's the mask. That fucking fart sounded like... <laughs> I could feel the heat! On the flip side, at one point he just says, buttholes. Buttholes. and recites a tangent about butt sex that goes nowhere. I'm not even going to get into the story he tells about the ostrich tattoo because it's been told a million times in other places. But if you know the story, you know the story. Eventually, we come back around to Steve-O talking about how he wanted to stop philandering so that eventually he could end up in a healthy relationship. I decided if I'm going to be happy in my life, I need to learn how to be in a healthy relationship. So he went to a therapist, who told Steve-O that after the next show, Steve-O should go straight to his room and call him to check in. Steve-O does this, but then contacts somebody through Twitter who doesn't even have a profile picture. You know you might be a sex addict when you invite that fucking person to your hotel room! Steve-O ends up banging this person who turns out to be a cam whore with scarred up boobs from a botched implant surgery, which he admits was a demoralizing moment. Here I was doing exactly what I promised myself over and over and over that I wouldn't do, and now I'm doing it with franken tits. <laughs> After this, Steve-O's therapist recommends he becomes sexually sober, which would start off with a 30-day period of abstinence, including no beating off. When I got to seven days, I could not be trusted with a laptop computer for any reason at all. While a lot of the prior 20 minutes were pretty hit or miss, I think this bit had a good bit of potential. Steve-O's description of a bath where the line between hygiene and romance gets blurred is pretty funny, but it's again undercut by some physical comedy that enters into 
Joe Rogan's stool humping territory. After this second failure, Steve-O was devastated and vowed to be abstinent for a full year. And Knoxville was confused by this decision and asked if Steve-O was trying to get prostate cancer, to which Steve-O had a great retort. If jacking off was the cure for prostate cancer, like nobody would have it. <laughs> Steve-O's logic for sexual sobriety was that when he finally did find that special woman, he could show her that he was capable of waiting. But when they did eventually fool around, she might have to wear a poncho because It'll look like a fucking Nickelodeon award show, man! Steve-O then says he managed to do his year of abstinence by hiring a professional cock blocker. But all he really accomplished was being exceptionally grumpy for a year. No real segue, but Steve-O kind of transitions into the fact that he's now a dog and cat rescuing, meditating, hybrid driving, clean and sober vegan who is adamant about not getting his dick sucked. But he doesn't want people to think he's a total pussy, so he does the stunt that will close the show. Which really just involved Tim Kennedy tasing the shit out of Steve-O for 30 seconds while he answered questions and then collapsed. As far as closing bits go, it's not the worst I've seen, and it certainly provides some entertainment value to the end of the show. Guilty as Charged was an interesting special to review because it was better than I expected it to be going in. Circumstances like this always make a special hard to rate. Was it actually as good as I thought it was, or am I being generous because I had the bar set pretty low in my mind beforehand? I'm not 100% sure. It certainly wasn't bad. This was not a situation like you'd be surprised where large chunks of the material felt like filler. It's not jamming in New York either, but I thought most of Steve-O's material was well-paced and included in the special for a reason. These seemed like stories he had worked on and refined for some time. The joke writing was pretty solid for a first-time special as well, and there was a decent arc that carried through the entire set. Nevertheless, there were some issues. There is a good bit of genuine cringe on this special. And then out comes my wiener. <laughs> A lot of it comes down to Steve-O making wacky noises or doing exaggerated physical comedy. It's not the worst I've seen. We're not talking about Chris D'Elia laughing himself into a fugue state, but a lot of jokes of the special are punctuated by Steve-O mugging or laughing at his own jokes. I think these are symptoms of the larger issue, which is that it feels like Steve-O was playing an exaggerated version of himself. He's dialing the Steve-O up several notches, and it frequently ruins the delivery of his jokes. Even if the material is largely pretty serviceable, the one thing that did disappoint me was that I was expecting more stunts. That's going to be a huge selling point of a Steve-O event, but they were pretty sparse. Aside from the lemon-scented brain injury early on and the closing stunt with a taser, we really only get two other stunts, and they were more like tricks to be honest. Steve-O talked about being a dealer after failing to make it as a clown, and when his bags were light, he would avoid altercations by doing these tricks. One being drinking water from a cup on his head without using his hands, and the other being balancing a big-ass ladder on his chin. I like them, but I only wish they were more common. I understand the difficulty of working them into a special, but with so few segues anyway, I think the special could have been separated into vignettes of material broken up with more stunts. With that in mind, it's a bit hard for me to judge this special too harshly given that Steve-O was seemingly knocked out within the first five minutes of the set. The UFC doesn't interview guys anymore after they get KO'd, so the fact that this guy was able to deliver 40 minutes of anything even remotely funny after being choked out and having his head bounced off the ground makes me want to cut him a little bit of slack. Overall, I did not dislike Guilty as Charged. Despite some cringe moments and jokes that I thought fell flat, it outperformed my expectations. I even got some decent, unironic laughs out of it. It fell into a range of probably not something I'll watch again, but not something that was difficult to watch or that I regret watching. Of the specials I've watched over the years for this channel, that puts it pretty close to the middle of the pack, if not better. Potentially worth a watch if you're really curious, but it's not going to knock your socks off either. That brings us to Steve-O's second official comedy special, the aptly named Gnarly. Gnarly came out in 2020, four years after Guilty as Charged. For better or worse, there were some changes to Steve-O's act during that time. The main issue with Guilty as Charged was that Steve-O's persona was dialed up a few too many notches, but on Gnarly, he's more laid back, which lets him deliver his stories more effectively. Another positive change is that these stories flow into each other a lot more smoothly, because Steve-O actually has pretty decent segues, most of the time. I've been to jail so many times, my butthole fell off. <laughs> that was just a joke. 
Steve-O transitions easily from talking about his SeaWorld protest to being arrested and billed for all of the public resources that were used to apprehend him. They sent me a bill for 80 firefighters, 18 cops, a helicopter, and a SWAT team. So I want to thank you guys for contributing to the Fuck SeaWorld Fund. This leads into a brief history of his garden variety crimes as a youth and how his crimes have become more colorful over the years, including getting arrested in Louisiana for stapling his ball sack to his leg. Which you wouldn't think was a crime. It's actually not. It's showing your dick to people that's a problem. Which gave him the idea for a stunt where he would paint on a pair of bike shorts. So I figure I should be able to paint my dick and do whatever I want. The bike short stunt is pretty funny, and you get to watch the reactions of people as they see Steve-O crash his bicycle while not wearing any pants. It's very much something I can imagine seeing in one of the Jackass movies. This flows into a story about how he had to R&D a method of scrote stapling that would hide his hog. This took serious research, physics, science, but I dug deep and I cracked the code. So he invented a move called the turtle. I'll let you imagine what that entails, but... Do know that Wee Man was involved. From here, Steve-O circles back to his arrest in Louisiana, for which they wanted to give him three years. While out on bail, he flew to Sweden, but not before trying to swallow a rubber full of weed with immense difficulty. And I'm freaking the fuck out right away. I'm like, oh no, my beautiful voice. <laughs> Steve-O would eventually manage to pass the obstruction and smoke the pot. Midway through the story, Steve-O does a smoking stunt, which involves bringing out Danger Aaron, shaving off some of his own pubes and gluing them to Aaron's face. Then he smokes some of his own hair out of his bare hand and shotguns it into Aaron's face. Oh, man. That was a part of the deal, man. Back to the Sweden story. Stevo had bragged about smuggling drugs so much during his tour that the Swedish police arrested him and held him for several days before eventually letting him go, presumably out of embarrassment because they couldn't find anything. This leads into another rubber stunt that Steve-O had recently done involving Chris Pontius and his own father. So that we could film my dad's reaction when I put it in my mouth and swallowed it. All things considered, handled it pretty well. Until the next day when Steve-O showed him the result of nature taking its course. At this point, the shock and disgust seemed to finally hit Steve-O's dad who appeared to dissociate. That's not even the worst of it, as during the live show, Steve-O brings his dad out onto the stage, ostensibly to apologize to him. But a certain latex object makes its return to stage and screen, but just as swiftly disappears once again. I'm not going to show you what happened, but I will play the audience's reaction. I went into this special blind, and this moment honestly kind of took me aback. This might be the biggest issue with Gnarly for me. Guilty as charged had some shock value and gross out humor, but Gnarly really cranks that shit up. There are significant chunks of this special that I almost certainly can't discuss in detail, let alone show you, for one reason or another. Arguably the tamest bit from the special was the stunt where Steve-O had the bike shorts painted on and walks around in public nude. That's the mildest stunt and it only gets more extreme and shocking from there. There are multiple examples of full-on nudity, consumption of various bodily fluids, and graphic footage of injury sustained in the process of performing stunts. The term not for the faint of heart gets thrown around a bit loosely, but there are multiple moments from this special that, if you have a weak stomach, I would advise you not to watch. I mean, at one point, he describes how he gave himself third-degree burns with rocket fuel, then peels off the blisters and threw them into the toilet, only then to fish it out and eat it on camera like a wet fruit roll-up. I consider myself to have a higher-than-average tolerance for this kind of stuff, but I still got a little uncomfortable on a few occasions. If the point was to have that sort of car crash moment that the audience couldn't look away from, I think it accomplished that, but also at the expense of bringing the set to a screeching halt. It's a Steve-O show, so you kind of know what you're getting yourself into, but if I'm being honest, I think it went a little too far. To the point that it actually kind of distracts from what I feel were genuine improvements to Steve-O's act and comedic ability. After this stunt, Steve-O transitions into talking about his struggles with substance abuse and getting sober. What I terrorized my family with was my crippling drug problem. This is where Gnarly has some of the same issues as Guilty as Charged. 
If you're someone who has followed Steve-O over the years, you've probably heard the stories about how he harassed his neighbor while incoherently high. It came to a point where half the time I was yelling at the top of my lungs at voices I was hearing in my head. The neighbor's only hearing my half of the conversation. It's fucking creepy. Or the story about the jackass intervention that led to him being 5150'd by Johnny Knoxville and entering rehab, only to then voluntarily check himself back into a mental institution, where he hung out with Mike Tyson. Who I had done a whole bunch of drugs with back in the day. The same can be said about the story of Bear Margera breaking Steve-O's nose with a sucker punch while shooting Jackass 3D, which Steve-O was pissed about and wanted to have paid for by the movie until a plastic surgeon told him he waited too long and he would have to re-break the nose to fix it. So I told him, it doesn't bug me that much. <laughs> this evolved into a stunt where Steve-O broke his nose again by running face first into Mike Tyson's fist during the Comedy Central roast of Charlie Sheen, a stunt he had been pursuing for some time up to that point. I'm saying, Mike, all I need you to do is hold your fist out and let me run into it with my face. Then he had a kung fu instructor from the audience set his broken nose for him. I got a Mike Tyson kung fu nose job for free. They're not bad stories. They flow together nicely and they culminate in this interesting bit about the Comedy Central roast of Charlie Sheen and Mike Tyson. And storytelling is Steve-O's strong suit in my opinion. It actually seems to come to him pretty effortlessly. I had to do all this crazy life-threatening bullshit with a newfound sense of clarity and concern for my health. But again, if you're familiar with Steve-O, a lot of this will feel a bit rehashed. At the same time, if you're new to Steve-O, most of these stories don't require a prior knowledge of Jackass lore to understand, and the fact that this special includes so many video clips does make it very easy to follow along for the uninitiated. The problem is, this special would be a questionable choice as a first exposure to Steve-O for the reasons mentioned earlier about the extreme content. It would be a bit like wanting to try hot sauce for the first time and immediately going for the Carolina Reaper Rectum Annihilator sauce. A bit that combines all of the pros and cons I've mentioned so far is the Fire Angels bit, which starts off with Steve-O describing the incidents of bad luck he's had over the years, like how he mangled both of his legs while doing a stunt involving standing on a porta potty as a car was driven through it. It was a fucking freak accident. <laughs> this leads to him telling the story of how he was playing around with fireworks in his living room. As you do, several of them went off without a hitch, and even when Steve-O upped the ante by using rocket fuel, he came out unscathed. Until he decided to pour a bunch out on the floor and make the aforementioned fire angels in it. Aside from having the shirt burned off his back, Steve-O didn't initially think the injuries were that bad, as he had prior experience with burns. But the next day, things had rapidly declined and he had massive blisters all over his body. Steve-O has since talked about this incident on his YouTube channel, but the long story short here is that he eventually had to go to the hospital because he had third degree burns, which necessitated emergency surgery and skin grafts from seven different people. While the give me some skin joke is a bit corny, I actually did find the following segment about sending gift cards to the relatives of the skin graft donors to be pretty funny. My dad heard that and he made a really good point. What family do you think is going to be happy to learn that their loved one's skin got wasted on an asshole who set himself on fire on purpose? And I was like, yeah, dad, you're right. Fuck those people. I'm obviously truncating the story quite a bit, and there are a lot of other good punchlines woven throughout this story. That said, I think it represents the special as a whole. Steve-O's storytelling is strong, and he's found a way to punctuate anecdotes with decent punchlines, albeit not always gracefully. At the same time, the shock value elements get as close to the line of acceptability as possible, if not cross over it. This special ends with Steve-O bringing everyone back on stage for a final moment, then brings out his girlfriend and proposes to her. It's a bit cheesy, but a little heartwarming as well. I've definitely seen worse. This is no Joe Piscopo singing to his fiance slash former babysitter to his children, Kimberly. There's evil forces working here, girl, they're trying to pull us apart. Apart? But it's true, my love for you is clearing through and straight from my heart. Mom, why don't they just let us be? Overall, Gnarly felt like a bit of a mixed bag to me. 
Personally, I thought Steve-O made some solid improvements to his delivery and comedic timing. There are a few unintentionally cringeworthy moments, but his ability to spin an entertaining yarn was improved as well. However, it also suffered from some of the same shortcomings as Guilty as Charged. Namely, these are not exactly new stories to fans of Steve-O, but it has the contradictory problem that it feels like a special that was devoted even further to Steve-O fans. It's more extreme and doubled down on shock value. It's a better special than Guilty as Charged, but that creates a pretty odd conundrum for me. Because although I like this, I don't think I could recommend it to anyone other than pretty serious fans of Steve-O or Jackass, who are used to gross and edgy stunts. Nevertheless, if you've got a stronger constitution, and you're into Steve-O's stuff, I would recommend it. It's funny, and I would argue genuinely pushed some boundaries. This brings me to Steve-O's most recent special, Bucket List, released in November of this year. It starts off with Steve-O giving you a warning that the special is filled with fucked up and dangerous stuff, and that there's a chance you might pass out while watching it. And while that may seem like an exaggeration, it actually happens three separate times during the show. We gotta pass her outer. <laughs> Following this disclaimer, we get the intro of the special, where Steve-O climbs on his roof and grabs the ladder of a helicopter being piloted by Bill Burr. Then he's dragged all over the place until he's eventually dropped on the roof of his tour bus, and he belays himself down through the door. It's honestly a really cool set piece stunt, and a great way to open the show. The concept of the show is pretty straightforward. Steve-O says that he's getting older, and he wants to do some outrageous stunts that have been on his bucket list before it starts getting too creepy to keep watching him do this. So essentially, it's a series of stories from Steve-O, explaining how he went about planning and executing some of these bucket list stunts, followed by the actual footage of the stunts, successful or otherwise. In my opinion, this works to Steve-O's advantage because they're fresh stories that aren't going to be targeted specifically at Steve-O or Jackass fans. You could go into Bucket List knowing very little about Steve-O and enjoy yourself, provided you enjoy the nature of the content. That's another thing. I feel like Steve-O was able to nail an effective build and intensity with the stunts and stories as the special progresses. So, I gotta warn you guys. You're gonna see some stuff. It starts off fairly lightly, with a bit called dick painting, which is similar to the bicycle shorts bit. But Steve-O does a variety of activities from working out, to surfing, to playing basketball and tennis, with nothing but a shirt on and body paint on his lower body. Maybe it's just the part of my brain that's still 12 years old, but there is something very funny to me about watching confused onlookers slowly realize what's going on as Steve-O's cock flops around covered in body paint. It feels like a classic jackass-style stunt, which I like. Things progress from here, with Steve-O opening up another bit about how, after all of these years, he and his friends somehow hadn't come up with the obvious idea to shit into a fan. But I think we can all agree the shit needed to hit the fan. <laughs> but despite all of his planning and preparation, it didn't go at all how he imagined. I've honestly had a hard time figuring out how I felt about this particular stunt, to the point that I didn't really know what to say about it. Even as I was finishing up editing the video, I went back and rewrote this portion of the review. The problem for me is that this part of the special is very straightforward and self-explanatory. It's not particularly gross or shocking, yet it also doesn't have the same effect as similar bits done over the years where there were unsuspecting bystanders witnessing the shenanigans. And it's made more underwhelming by Steve-O hyping it up beforehand. So I went on Amazon and got myself the most badass one I could find. The way he described the stunt, I was expecting him to be in a harness, hanging over an airboat propeller or something. Instead, it's just Steve-O standing over a relatively unimpressive fan and dropping a deuce into it until shit went sideways. Literally. It's kind of a letdown. I don't know if it's my least favorite bit, but it's probably the one that I felt was the least developed. The vasectomy Olympics is where it really begins to ramp up, in my opinion. The story starts with Steve-O saying that he and his fiance do not want to have kids, and from the beginning of their relationship, he was serious about the pull-out method. However, he no longer has to worry about that because of the next stunt. The setup here is that when Steve-O was 12 years old, he heard the joke that the definition of macho is a man who jogs home from his vasectomy. That concept stuck with him for years, but he wanted to up the ante. So I remembered that joke and literally grew up with the idea that I should get a vasectomy and then do a whole lot more than just jog. 
which led to the idea of the vasectomy Olympics. Before he could go through with the procedure, though, he wanted to answer a question that people had been asking him for years. After all of the terrible things that have happened to my balls, could I even have kids if I wanted to? So before having the procedure, he decided to get his sperm counted. I won't ruin the joke, but I'll let Steve-O give you a hint. Number one, if it does not kill you, it actually makes you stronger. <laughs> this leads into Steve-O actually getting the procedure done on camera which, as Steve explained, is apparently the point at which a lot of people faint during the show. This next video, as well as a few of the ones that come after it, has proven to make some people pass the fuck out. I didn't think it was particularly bad, though, but the point where Steve-O realized that they had to do it twice did make me chuckle. From here, we get the vasectomy Olympics, which is basically just Steve-O getting his testicles abused in a variety of different ways, mere hours after the procedure, and against doctor's advice. The techniques range from riding a horse bareback to having children beat him like a pinata. Again, for me, as a fan of Jackass, this is right up my alley. It feels like a classic stunt along the lines of the cup test, but made just a little bit more extreme and comedic. This brings me to what is my favorite bit from the special, the anesthesia bike. I think this is part of the special where Steve-O's storytelling really shines, as he explains the thought process and development of the stunt. Initially, it came from Steve-O's love of animals and trying to think of an alternative to trophy hunters killing animals just to take a picture. So that's what got me started thinking about tranquilizer darts. <laughs> Steve-O's idea was to challenge one of his friends to a foot race where they would be shot with tranquilizer darts and the last one to hit the ground won. This leads to a humorous anecdote about trying to find somebody with a trank gun who could make the idea happen, which his shady co-producer was able to do with relatively little effort. But there was a problem, as Steve-O learned exactly what was in the trank darts. Animal tranquilizer, also known as ketamine. The problem with that is, I'm a recovering drug addict, and I really like ketamine. <laughs> Following this hiccup, they did some more research, and the idea evolved into Steve-O being given IV anesthesia while riding a bike. But even that presented some problems, as the doctors they spoke to warned Steve-O against using propofol. Michael Jackson's bedtime snack. <laughs> Eventually, they settled on the right anesthesia and found a doctor willing to administer it as long as their identity was concealed and they had an undisclosed location to film in. Unfortunately, the stunt did not go as planned. Even after Steve-O had been given more than twice the necessary dose of anesthesia, he just rode the bike around like a crazy person, on drugs. Etomidate felt fucking fantastic. <laughs> Steve-O was really disappointed in the failure of this stunt, until he met this one dude who said he could put a four-inch needle into his spine and inject something that would paralyze Steve-O from the waist down and drop him in the middle of a full sprint. So, Steve-O called up his friend Dr. Drew for a second opinion. Drew said, wow, do I hate that idea. After being warned about the danger of this kind of procedure, he weighed the risks and went through with it. And it went almost exactly as the guy described. Steve-O ran around for a little bit and then dropped like a sack of potatoes. Unfortunately, he did suffer from some numbness all the way up to his chest, which his very concerned friends helped him with by shooting him with paintballs, tasing him, and holding lighters up to his feet. Overall, this is my favorite bit because... As I said earlier, it really lets Steve-O's storytelling ability shine. Old Dr. Shaky Hands got right to it. The way his hands trembled with that needle put everybody at ease. And although the stunt itself was a bit of a failure, the outcome was actually pretty amusing in the end. The next bit focuses on Steve-O's attempt to get cauliflower ear, which arose from hanging out with Chuck Liddell. And one day while hanging out with Chuck, I asked him, you think you could give me cauliflower ear? To make this idea a reality, Steve-O had a special helmet design that would protect him from suffering any more brain damage, while also allowing Chuck to get medieval on his ears with fists, his head, and an assortment of sports equipment. To no avail, as unfortunately, Steve-O did not develop cauliflower ear. So he brought in even more MMA fighters, Ronda Rousey and John Jones to be specific. But even after having John split his ear open with his belt and a hammer, he still didn't get cauliflower ear. Somebody told me there are certain people who just cannot get cauliflower ear. I'm starting to think I might be one of those people. I will say, the scene where Steve-O had a chunk of his ear cut off with scissors arguably got the biggest pop of the show, though. One, two... Okay. Woo! I told ya! This is where we come to what feels like the true climax of the show, even if it isn't the closer. 
a stunt which Steve-O dubbed the PP Party, which was inspired by a stunt Steve-O attempted in the last Jackass movie that failed because they ran out of piss. After everything I've talked about so far, I'm sure that hearing PP Party already has your mind spinning with possible scenarios, but whatever you're thinking probably doesn't match what Steve-O actually did. I'm not going to demystify whatever image you've created in your mind palace, though. What I will tell you is that this stunt involves Steve-O, his friends, and his fiance pissing in jugs until they had 190 gallons of fermented piss, just to make sure they wouldn't run out this time. We were growing green algae in rotten urine for months. There was enough pee-pee to fill up multiple balloons, as well as a kiddie pool that was used to invent a world record that I doubt will ever be attempted again, let alone broken. While the pee-pee party stunt is not my favorite bit from the special, I think it is the peak of the show. It's the moment the roller coaster crests the top of the hill. It's another stunt that really pushes the boundary of acceptability. It's not necessarily as viscerally unpleasant as some of the ones from Gnarly, but that may just be because you can't smell it. For me, I think this should have been Steve-O's closing bit, but I can understand why he went with the skyjacking stunt instead. On paper, it's a bigger bit that involves Steve-O jacking off while skydiving, hence skyjacking. It was the idea mentioned at the beginning of the show to explain his bucket list concept. For example, the last 20 years, every time skydiving ever came up, I always said, man, if I ever go skydiving, I'm going to be butt-ass naked and furiously jacking off. That being said, it was my least favorite part of the show. Don't get me wrong. I enjoyed the build-up and background to the stunts, as I did with the other stories Steve O tells on the special. There are plenty of funny anecdotes regarding how they organized the stunt and found the right skydiving company. How they narrowed it down from 70 people to 20 to ultimately one. Because only one guy said please. <laughs> that said, I feel like this bit goes on for too long and Steve-O overly explains every detail of the stunt, which ultimately breaks down to him struggling to interact with his tube before busting right as he jumps out of the plane. I do like the callback to his pulling out joke from earlier, but when you actually watch the stunt, it feels underwhelming, because it's been thoroughly described beforehand. There is no surprise here, as there was with the other bits. Like I said earlier, I understand why this was the closer. It's a big set piece stunt with tie-ins and callbacks to other parts of the show. I think it could have worked better as the metaphorical and literal climax of the show if Steve-O explained it a little less beforehand, or if it was broken up in such a way that we got short clips of the stunt as he described things. That way we don't just get a lengthy info dump from Steve-O, followed by a clip of the thing he described in exacting detail. Nonetheless, it isn't a bad bit. It's just my least favorite. But I do think he pulls it back around a bit with his closing joke. There are other comedians who have gotten into a lot of trouble for making people watch them jack off. <laughs> but when I do it, it's totally cool. <laughs> Steve-O truly is one of, if not the only person that could actually pull something like this off. Of the three specials I reviewed for this video, Bucket List was my favorite. It's the one that I could see myself watching again sometime in the future, or recommending to people. Even people unfamiliar with Steve-O. I think he struck a good balance between stand-up slash storytelling and entertaining stunts. In terms of idea and execution, it is basically what I would ask for from a Steve-O special. I also think he toned down the gross-out aspect just enough, because I think you can only push the envelope so far or so much until it kind of stops being funny and just becomes disgusting. Bucketless navigates that line in a way that is exciting and hard to look away from, without being truly revolting. When I look at these specials and the framework of the question that I set up at the beginning of the video, I think there has been an obvious progression to Steve-O's stand-up. I don't see this as a Brendan Schaub situation. I know I've mentioned him a few times, but that is because I think he's a frame of reference that a lot of you will understand. The biggest gripe that most people had with Schwabo's comedy career was that they felt like he had been rushed into an undeserved Showtime special because of his connections with Joe Rogan. The end result was the half-baked product we now know as You'd Be Surprised. Even after several more years and claims of moldering at the comedy store, Shab put out a shorter, yet somehow even worse special in Gringo Poppy. More broadly, Shab has also failed to leverage what made him unique and interesting among other comics, outside of a chunk of material on You'd Be Surprised, which is really just a falsified account of how he got KO'd by Travis Brown and decided to retire from MMA. With Steve-O, it's clearly different. 
He's been working at this for years now, and he's definitely gotten better at comedy in that time. He's tried things out. Some worked and some didn't. Through that process, he's refined his act to a solid format that capitalized on what made him famous and plays to his strengths as a performer. Interesting and comedic stories interspersed with crazy stunts. Some people may debate whether Steve-O's act is truly stand-up comedy because it's not 100% a dude just talking into a microphone. To be honest, I don't really care about that distinction. I think the stunts fulfill a comedic role, which was always something I enjoyed about them going all the way back to the old jackass days. I recognize that this style of comedy won't be for everyone though. As I said in the beginning, that was one of the facets of this video that made it an interesting challenge to me. How do I take something I personally like and talk about it in the most open and objective way I can? I think I accomplished that goal and explained my reasoning well. At the end of the day, I like these specials. They're not without flaws, but I found them entertaining. And frankly, I think they've gotten better with each new release. This wasn't something I thought I would be saying before I made this video, but I'm interested to see what the next Steve-O special is like. With this special being framed as his bucket list of stunts, I wonder how much further he can take this concept. What is he going to bring to this stage in the future? These are interesting questions, and I look forward to seeing the answers. As always, I want to thank you for watching the video, as well as liking, commenting, and subscribing. And a special thank you to my supporters on Patreon who help make these videos possible. Thank you, Pancho Villa, Jonas Namenson, Rusty Shackelford, Jackson, Fightback CBD, Mike Robals, Bone CK, Scott Richmond, Fisherman 666, Random Candor, Fuzi Yunus, Duddled Neon, Timothy Lee Peterson, Julius Caesar has Jungle Fever, Ellie, Firebrand, Quasi, Snepsts, Alex, and Neem.